This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. Part 2, Section 4. Recording by Steve Brown. I begin with the book of Genesis. In the 14th chapter of Genesis, the writer gives an account of Lot being taken prisoner in a battle between the four kings against five and carried off, and that when the account of Lot being taken came to Abraham, he armed all his household and marched to rescue Lot from the captors, and that he pursued them unto Dan. Verse 14. To show in what manner this expression, pursuing them unto Dan, applies it to the case in question, I will refer to two circumstances, the one in America, the other in France. The city now called New York in America was originally New Amsterdam, and the town in France, lately called Avre Marat, was before called Avre de Grasse. New Amsterdam was changed to New York in the year 1664, Avre de Grasse to Avre Marat in 1793. Should, therefore, any writing be found, though without date, in which the name of New York should be mentioned, it would be certain evidence that such a writing could not have been written before, but must have been written after New Amsterdam was changed to New York, and consequently not till after the year 1664, or at least during the course of that year. And, in like manner, any dateless writing with the name of Avre Marat would be certain evidence that such a writing must have been written after Avre de Grasse became Avre Marat, and consequently, not till after the year 1793, or at least during the course of that year. I now come to the application of those cases, and to show that there was no such place as Dan till many years after the death of Moses, and, consequently, that Moses could not be the writer of the book of Genesis, where this account of pursuing them into Dan is given. The place that is called Dan in the Bible was originally a town of the Gentiles called Laish, and when the tribe of Dan seized upon this town, they changed its name to Dan, in commemoration of Dan, who was the father of that tribe and the great-grandson of Abraham. To establish this in proof, it is necessary to refer from Genesis to the 18th chapter of the book called the Book of Judges. It is there said, verse 27, that they, the Danites, came unto Laish to a people that were quiet and secure and they smote them with the edge of the sword, the Bible is filled with murder, and burned the city with fire, and they built the city, verse 28, and dwelt therein, and they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father. Howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. This account of the Danites taking possession of Laish and changing it to Dan is placed in the book of Judges immediately after the death of Samson. The death of Samson is said to have happened 1,120 years before Christ, and that of Moses 1,451 before Christ, and therefore, according to the historical arrangement, the place was not called Dan till 331 years after the death of Moses. There is a striking confusion between the historical and the chronological arrangement in the book of Judges. The five last chapters, as they stand in the book, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, are put chronologically before all the preceding chapters. They are made to be 286 years before the 16th chapter, 266 before the 15th, 245 before the 13th, 195 before the 9th, 90 before the 4th, 
and 15 years before the first chapter. This shows the uncertain and fabulous state of the Bible. According to the chronological arrangement, the taking of Laish and giving it the name of Dan is made to be 20 years after the death of Joshua, who was the successor of Moses, and by the historical order as it stands in the book, it is made to be 306 years after the death of Joshua and 331 after that of Moses, but they both exclude Moses from being the writer of Genesis because, according to either of the statements, no such place as Dan existed in the time of Moses, and therefore the writer of Genesis must have been some person who lived after the town of Laish had the name of Dan, and who that person was nobody knows, and consequently the book of Genesis is anonymous and without authority. I proceed now to state another point of historical and chronological evidence, and to show therefrom, as in the preceding case, that Moses is not the author of the book of Genesis. In the 36th chapter of Genesis, there is given a genealogy of the sons and descendants of Esau, who are called Edomites, and also a list by name of the kings of Edom, in enumerating of which it is said, verse 31, And these are the kings that reigned in Edom, before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. Now, were any dateless writings to be found in which, speaking of any past events, the writer should say, these things happened before there was any Congress in America, or before there was any convention in France, it would be evidence that such writing could not have been written before, and could only be written after there was a Congress in America, or a convention in France, as the case might be and, consequently, that it could not be written by any person who died before there was a Congress in the one country or a convention in the other. Nothing is more frequent, as well in history as in conversation, that to refer to a fact in the room of a date, it is most natural so to do, first, because a fact fixed itself in the memory better than a date. Secondly, because the fact includes the date, and serves to excite two ideas at once. And this manner of speaking, by circumstances, implies as positively that the fact alluded to is past, as if it were so expressed. When a person speaking upon any matter says, It was before I was married, or before my son was born, or before I went to America, or before I went to France, it is absolutely understood, and intended to be understood, that he had been married, that he has had a son, that he has been in America, or been in France. Language does not admit of using this mode of expression in any other sense, and whenever such an expression is found anywhere, it can only be understood in the sense in which it only could have been used. The passage, therefore, that I have quoted, that these are the kings that reigned in Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel, could only have been written after the first king began to reign over them, and, consequently, that the book of Genesis, so far from having been written by Moses, could not have been written till the time of Saul at least. This is the positive sense of the passage, but the expression, any king, implies more kings than one. At least it implies two, and this will carry it to the time of David, and if taken in a general sense, it carries it through all the time of the Jewish monarchy. Had we met with this verse in any part of the Bible that professed to have been written after kings began to reign in Israel, it would have been impossible not to have seen the application of it. It happens then that this is the case. The two books of Chronicles, which gave a history of all the kings of Israel, are professedly, as well as in fact, written after the Jewish monarchy began 
and this verse that I have quoted in all the remaining verses of the 36th chapter of Genesis are word for word in the first chapter of Chronicles beginning at the 43rd verse. It was with consistency that the writer of the Chronicles could say, as he has said, 1 Chronicles chapter I, verse 43. These are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel, because he was going to give, and has given, a list of the kings that had reigned in Israel. But as it is impossible that the same expression could have been used before that period, it is as certain as anything that can be proved from historical language that this part of Genesis is taken from Chronicles and that Genesis is not so old as Chronicles and probably not so old as the book of Homer or as Aesop's fables, admitting Homer to have been, as the tables of chronology state, contemporary with David or Solomon, and Aesop to have lived about the end of the Jewish monarchy. Take away from Genesis the belief that Moses was the author, on which only the strange belief that it is the word of God has stood, and there remains nothing of Genesis but an anonymous book of stories, fables, and traditionary or invented absurdities, or of downright lies. The story of Eve and the serpent, and of Noah and his ark, drops to a level with the Arabian tales, without the merit of being entertaining, and the account of men living to eight and nine hundred years becomes as fabulous immortality of the giants of the mythology. Besides, the character of Moses, as stated in the Bible, is the most horrid that can be imagined. If those accounts be true, he was the wretch that first began and carried on wars on the score or on the pretense of religion, and under that mask, or that infatuation, committed the most unexampled atrocities that are to be found in the history of any nation, of which I will state only one instance. When the Jewish army returned from one of their plundering and murdering excursions, the account goes on as follows. Numbers chapter 31, verse 13. And Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel, through the counsel of Balaam, to commit trespass against the Lord in the manner of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known a man by lying with him. But all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. End of section 4